Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hey, it's great that you're all back with us with Mandy Pacheco, the Hollywood historian, Forgotten Hollywood. And uh, we're going to have an amazingly fun conversation today, but I have no idea what the subject is. Do you, John? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do because I'm choosing the subject great under the list of great directors, Manny. Mm. And God knows there have been millions, not millions, but many of them. And we've talked about a lot of great directors. But under that list, I want to go back to the first Academy Award uh, to Wings. Mm. And the director of that film, William Wellman. Mm -hmm. Do I have that right? William Wellman, that's right. He was unique among directors. A yes. And what little I've heard about him was that he was called Wild Bill because he had, before he ever came to movies, he was a rooting, rooting, tooting, shooting, I don't know, was he worked in the in the army or whatever it was? He was a wild man. And then he got into film. So how did that happen? Yeah, he was a, he was a wild man. And you're right. I mean, it would be easy for us to sit here and pine uh, eloquently about, you know, Alfred Hitchcock or Billy Wilder or John Ford, even, you know, more modern, you know, uh, Spielberg or, or Scorsese. But William Wellman had such a dynamite life and career. And for some reason, he just is under the radar. I think he's, he deserves a mention. Wild Bill Wellman uh, played hockey in high school, uh, loved to uh, loved to start fights. He was just one of those brawling, tough, mean kind of guys. Uh, and he had the pleasure of meeting Douglas Fairbanks while he was playing hockey, and that was a that was a break that would, would come up later. But first, there was World War One, and and he he flew for the uh, the French, uh, the French uh, uh, legion of, of flyers that, that that were battling Germany at the time, and he got hurt. I mean, he had a, 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 actually a pilot stick go into the plate of his mouth. He he broke his back. He survived the, uh, the, the, the ordeal, but he came back a tough, uh, hardened man with a soft heart for men. He had, that, he had that relationship that soldiers have in war, you know, that, that, that close buddy relationship that would sit with him for the rest of his life. And so, you know, by the time he made his first film, he had already lived a really full life and he could have died. But... Um, but instead, we are blessed with a litany of great stories about Wild Bill Wellman. And the, 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 I guess the question you're probably alluding to is how he ended up getting into Hollywood. Well, after meeting Douglas Fairbanks a decade before, maybe a decade before, uh, he remembered uh, that, that Douglas Fairbanks married to Mary Pickford, lived in wonderful Pickfair overlooking Hollywood. He decided to take a plane, one of those World War I biplanes, and dressed in full uniform, landed into the pick fair polo field and um, reintroduced himself. And because of his flair for the dramatic, Fairbanks put him in a movie as an actor. He saw himself on screen and went to the bathroom and threw up. He decided <laughs> then and there acting was not for him and uh, he wanted to become a director. And there you go. Well, he, he certainly got Fairbanks' attention, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so his, his flying ability, um, uh, did that, uh, obviously, with John's opening uh, uh, salvo about wings, uh, you would think that uh, something about his flying gave him a special in to uh, Hollywood, uh, given that absolutely. skill set he had. Totally correct on that. Uh, they could have hired any number of directors. I think a, a really good choice might have been King Vidor. Uh, but they went with the, the unknown, William Wellman. I mean, he really was just at the start of his career as a director, didn't have any real big budgeted film under his belt. And the only reason they gave him the film was because of his flying experience. Now, because he was such a tactician as a director, uh, he spent way over budget I'm making sure that the uh, plane shots were shot against clouds and they were shot at the right time. He kept like 12 cameramen ready at all times so that they could get people up there. He trained his actors to fly. They had to not only 
direct the piece while they were up there. They would have to, because the actors themselves were directing themselves in, in the background shots, so, and they had to fly the plane while they were doing it. And they had another pilot, obviously, there that was more trained in the back with the camera person. And that's how you got these great dramatic shots. And uh, But he went way over budget. And I have to tell you, the, uh, the Paramount Pictures just were so angry at him. And they were sure they had a terrible film in their midst, even though it starred the it girl, Clara Bow, um, that they went to the premiere thinking it was going to be a flop. Instead, it was a huge event, except that William Wellman wasn't invited. And even wow. after I went across the country as a huge event and got nominated for the first Academy Awards and, 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 and for Best Picture, Wellman wasn't invited to, to the Academy oh. Awards either. I can't <laughs> believe that. Yeah, he just he never played the political game. He was never he was never one to practice politics. He just wanted to make a good film and he wasn't going to compromise because the moguls wanted to, you know, save some money. They, that's just not the way he worked. That's not his his thing. So a couple of other things. He hired this unknown actor who became a big star for one scene in which he dies. And that's Gary Cooper. So basically, he discovered Gary Cooper. Wow. Really? You know, and, 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 you know, his fan mail, I mean, actually increased tenfold after his appearance in Wings. And had one scene, just one scene. But there's Gary Cooper. Sure. Now, Wellman went on to do have a long career. Yeah. It's not like he only did Wings. No. And let me just tell you, it would be great if he just had a litany of, of career moves. But the choices he made. And the decisions he made in filmmaking ma making make him really different from some of the other directors, maybe with the exception of Hitchcock. Uh, remember that in silent films, you could do all sorts of swashbuckling action and this and that, because you didn't have any kind of sound. I mean, no, no sound coming from the screen. When talkies emerged, for, for a number of years there, they had to put microphones in plants and people could not move. So they were static. Everybody was static. And so movies of the 19, like 1929, 28, 29, 30, not very good movies, not very memorable. We don't remember, maybe, maybe Coconut, the Coconuts from Marx Brothers, but that's about it. Nobody knew. It took William Wellman the idea of how to place cameras and, and microphones so that people could actually walk down a street or cars could move. It took his expertise and what he did in Wings that now changed the landscape of movie making. And from, let's say, 1931 on, films became very, very um, movable. There, there was a lot of a lot more action, less static. And it's all because of William Wellman's ability to do that. And his first showcase of that was it, it was the Warner Brothers picture, The Public Enemy. Everybody at Warner Brothers thought, oh, another gangster film. No, it was Wellman who thought he was going to make it the gangster film and the first thing he did besides making it a very movable thing where people could move around and, and have some you know have some excitement was that he took the lead of the film and the second lead of the film and he switched them so now the lead of the film was james cagney it was his idea to make james cagney the star of the film like gary cooper he discovered James Cagney's ability to star in a film. Wow. wow. That, you know, just those two things alone you make think? him a really a, a important director. Yeah, but he did so much more. I mean, he, he hated the politics of Hollywood so much that he was determined to co-write with another, uh, I, I don't know the name, but the, the, another writer of, of screenplays to talk about the, the hypocrisy of Hollywood. Um, he made so many great films uh, and was nominated for a number of things, but the only time that he walked away for an, with an Oscar was for this writing effort talking about the hypocrisy of Hollywood. And that's great, but when I tell you the name of the film, you're just going to be amazed because this film would influence, dare I say, almost 100 years of filmmaking. The name of the film, a Star is Born. He is the oh, co-writer wow. really? of A Star. When the movie was made with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper, yeah. the Wellman Estate received money for the use of their screenplay in the way it was adapted and everything so he, else. He wrote the original screenplay. 
Yes, and it's been adapted four times. But he's the one that wrote the screenplay that that starred uh, Janet Gaynor and Frederick March. Wait, wow. could, they, <laughs> could this be a but wait? There's but more. wait, there's more. Is there more? <laughs> oh, absolutely. How much more? He, I mean, he worked with all the top stars, Frederick March, and he worked with, like I said, Janet Gaynor. He worked with Barbara Stanwyck. Um, but he, you know, he wasn't political about things, but there was one thing that really stuck in his craw, and that was the concept of something that was just ghastly in the 1920s and the 1930s that he just wanted to speak out against. So he, he made a pet project, uh, the idea of fighting against lynching. He was influenced by the movie Fury, the MGM movie with Spencer Tracy, but yeah. he wanted to do much more, and he realized he couldn't make it modern. So he turned to the Western, and he was the man who put out there the ugly idea of why lynching is a bad thing with the creation of one of the masterpieces of filmmaking, The Oxbow Incident. Yes. Yeah. Vastly unpopular movie because it has such a dreary ending. But if you look at how Henry Fonda plays the part, amb ambivalent as most people are about getting involved with controversial things, Eventually does the right thing, but it, 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 the ambivalence is what really is evil in this movie, not the actual act. But the actual act for audiences of that time were, were mortified. I mean, they would leave. Uh, uh, Harry Morgan, who's in the film, was sitting at a, um, at a screening, one of those pre-screenings before the audience gets to see it, the real audience, you know, the, the, the theater-going audience. One of those, uh, um, you know, the, the, the audience didn't expect they were going to see this film. But one of the people that was invited to this film was Orson Welles. And Orson Welles saw that the audiences, when, when the movie was over, they were just like. And he walked back and he stopped at Harry Morgan, who's just, you know, he's just a character actor at that point. And he looked at him, he says, they don't know what they saw. And then walked away. And Harry Morgan says. I think I've just been complimented. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's, it's, uh, Mr. Wilman is probably one of the most influential people that most of us have never heard of. Yeah. And Who then knew? I, I had never heard his name before. I got to tell you one more story. And, you know, he he shaped the gangster film. Um. He did, a, he did a number on Westerns, too, and, I, and the Oxbow incident is just one of many Westerns. But where he really shined was the way he shaped movie making about war. He was the man who created basically that documentary style of war making that you see in The Longest Day. But he did it with two films, uh, uh, the MGM film Battleground, which, which really was more character development than actual war. He also did it with Bo Jest, but that's a different kind of war. Uh, but where he really shined was being able to tell the story of the great, great man, great journalist, great humanitarian, Ernie Pyle. He yeah. told his story while Ernie Pyle was still alive. And Burgess Meredith got to play him, got to meet him. And Wellman and Meredith would really pick at Ernie Pyle and try to figure out how we should play him. And Pyle had just come back from war. He was very aware of post-traumatic syndrome. He was very aware of making sure that the G.I. Joes themselves were not forgotten. He didn't care about the majesty of generals. He didn't care about MacArthur or Patton or Eisenhower. He cared about the kids in the trenches and tried to bring that story back to the moms and dads back home so that they wouldn't worry so much. And it, it, leave it to Wellman to be able to tell this story in such a really warm way. And the reason why this story really has such a bittersweet uh, a, a tale to it is that um, some of the rushes Ernie Pyle got to see, he was so thrilled about it. But then he was off to war. He was off to the Pacific campaign. And when the, when the movie was finally made and it was screened for the people who made the film, you know how the director sits there and they, you know, it's a little room. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, John. I'm sure you've sure. done that. You sit, sure. in a, sit in a little room with the, the camera people and the makeup people and the, the writers, and you watch it for the first time. When they walked out of the room and said, we've got something here, it was that day they found out that Ernie Pyle died from a sniper's bullet. Oh. A Japanese rifle. Mm. What a shame. 
And so it made the whole thing bittersweet, and it made it even more bittersweet because he used real soldiers when they filmed, and he also knew that many of those soldiers were never going to come back. A tough film to make. Only William Wellman could have made that film. Yeah. Well, from Wings, World War One, to Ernie Pyle, World War Two. Story of G.I. Joe is called. Yeah. Quite a, quite a oeuvre yeah. of uh, war films. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he made great films, uh, but he was a great man. Uh, uh, he was, in many ways, a humanitarian, and he was just a tough SOB who just lived life to the fullest. And, you know, he did have one rock, one support. He, if, if, the, if, if the movie studios didn't want him anymore, and for a time, there were, like, you know, months at a time they might not need him, he always was able to return to his wife, his 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 fifth wife, his wife, and his 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 seven children and his like twenty some grandchildren. So he was a real family man. And if, if I if you can allow me this, um, I happen to be friends with William Wellman Jr., who's still alive. He last week face Facebook friended me. We were friends. Um, I was able to have a wonderful conversation with Bill Wellman Jr. Uh, to talk about his father. Uh, when I was at Cinecon one year, uh, and it was um, it was such a treat and such a joy, and I'm I'm happy to say that uh, I, I count William Wellman Jr. Uh, if not a close friend, at least a friend, and I'm and I'm happy about that. Well, what a wonderful uh, career, and he, I would imagine, right to the end, was Wild Bill Wellman. Wild Bill Wellman. <laughs> well, thank you again, Matty, for like an amazing series of stories about somebody we didn't know about who was quite important to the entire uh, Hollywood scene, not just war movies, but just in general, uh, a tough, tough guy who made very, very memorable films. Absolutely, I agree. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.